And I appreciate you coming every night. And uh, I enjoy your children. Uh, it's, it's good to be around little kids. I love them, man. I'll tell you what, there's, there's, no, there's no pretense. There's no barriers up, you know. Uh, some of them come up and they look at me and stick out their tongue and go, I can't. And I, think, and I feel the same way sometimes. And then some of them come up and hug me, you know, and some of them bring me little notes. And I, I think I need to start a collection, a whole file drawer of uh, notes from my kids, you know, and, and just uh, keep them on file. But I appreciate the, the young children around here and the desire that they have. You know, this is the only church that I've ever gone to where I had a child ask me how many chapters I read in my Bible. Think about that. I've been to a lot of churches. I've talked to a lot of kids. But this is the only church that I've ever been to where a child asked me how many chapters I read in my Bible. And that tells me something. I mean, there's an interest there in the Word of God. There's an interest there in uh, knowing. Uh, you know, Brother McDowell, how much Bible do you read every day? <laughs> Just keep asking the question. Ask all these people around here. Run around there and ask them, kids, how much Bible do you read every day? <laughs> It's kind of convicting, you know that, when a child comes up, especially if you've been real busy that day and you didn't get too much in. <laughs> so you say, well, it varies. <laughs> sometimes I read a whole lot and sometimes I just read a little bit. <laughs> but it was a blessing to be around your children. And I appreciate your fellowship uh, and just hanging around here at the church after everything's over and done with and talk until... Well, one night we stayed until midnight, I believe, and uh, I enjoyed the fellowship. It's good to just have fellowship with the saints of God, and I've had a good time. And I'm thankful to Jesus for making it all possible. Yeah. You know, if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ, we wouldn't have anything in common. We wouldn't be here. Uh, we'd be someplace else tonight. We'd be out in the world of sin. And uh, I'm just thankful that Jesus Christ has made it all possible. And remember this, in 1998, keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And work this year as though it's the last year, because I, I believe it is the last year. And uh, let's go down the home stretch. I, I have a little card that I carry with me. It was written to me by one of the men of the church. And uh, he's been a blessing. And he wrote me a very, um, a very from-the-heart type of letter one time at a, a period of time in my life when I really needed it. And every now and then I just pull it out and read it because it is such a blessing every time I read it. And he said, Brother McDowell, take us across the finish line. And sometimes you realize that it's not just you that's running in the race, but there's a whole lot of people running with you. And they're sort of looking to you to keep them going. And he just wants me to take him across the finish line. In other words, he's saying, as long as you're running, I can run. But if you, if you quit, I might quit too. And I say, keep your eyes on Jesus. I could possibly quit. I hope I never do. It's not in my heart to quit. I've never been a quitter. I don't want to quit. I even despise the idea of it. But keep your eyes on Jesus. And no matter what happens, you keep on going and go across the finish line. If I lived in this area, I know what church I'd come to. I know I'd be right here in this church, letting Brother Martin preach to me every week. And I would come in as a sponge... And I'd sit there like a great big sponge and I would absorb everything that he had to give to me. I would have a notebook. I would have a pen. I would take down notes. I would write down sayings. I would write down in il illustrations. I would sponge everything off of him that I could possibly get. And then I'd ask God to open a door of opportunity for me to go out and use what I've received from the Lord. And I know this about Brother Art. He'll love you. He'll pray for you, and he'll feed you. And what more could you ask from a preacher? I trust that 1998 will be a year that you stick together, that you unify as a church, because one day 
You will not just stand before the judgment seat of Christ, but one day you will stand as a church. And in 2 Corinthians, there's a... This is not where I'm going to preach, but you can turn over there. In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 12, or chapter 11, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth, he said, I've espoused you to one husband. I've espoused you to Jesus Christ. And he said, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And I'm not saying I understand everything about that passage of Scripture right there. But I believe this. Not only will we give account of our works for the Lord Jesus Christ as individuals, but we'll give account of our works as a group. This church is here for a purpose. It's got a work to do. And someday, as a group, you'll stand before Christ and you'll give account. Did you do the work that I set before you to do? And in that day, you do not want to be guilty of having to stand before Jesus and say, Lord, I didn't do my share, I didn't pull my my weight. I didn't help out. I just sort of came and got what I could, but I didn't really do anything. And you certainly don't want to be guilty of standing before the Lord and saying, Lord, I really wasn't even a blessing to the church. I went there and I was a member there, but you know, I probably caused problems. When we get to the judgment seat of Christ, let's be able to stand together and say, by the grace of God, we did what we could for Jesus. Do a job, do a work for Jesus as a church. Take your Bible now and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is where I'd like to preach from for a few minutes tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'd like to read to you the first 13 verses of this passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as... We were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not only the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remembered, brother, you, for ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, For laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also we thank, God, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Tonight I want to preach to you 
a message that I've entitled, A Job Well Done. And my points tonight will be from verse 3, Paul's exhortation, from verse 7, where Paul says they were an example unto them, and down in verse 9, where he talked about the way they labored and where their energy was concentrated. Our Heavenly Father, tonight I pray that you would bless the Word of God. Speak to our hearts now. Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit of God might be able to minister to each and every person that's in this place. And Father, help us to be able to see the work that you have before us. I pray that, Father, you would give these people a clear vision of what you want them to do in 1998. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you might give Brother Art all the strength and all the boldness and all the energy that he needs to carry on the work that you've placed him here to do. I pray, Lord, that there would be laborers that would join hand in hand and support him in prayer and back him, Father, and go forward to do the work that you've left us here to do. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, if there's anyone in here that Father came in with a critical heart or a critical eye and just looking for something to complain about, pick apart, chew on. God, I pray that you would deal with their heart tonight. And Father, Lord, before we look at others and look around, help us to look at ourselves. And Father, help us to examine our own heart and motive and help us, Lord, to take a look at the beam that's in our own eye before we try to pull the moat out of someone else's. Father, I pray now that you would just do the work that needs to be done. Lord, I do not know what it is. I do not know, Father, what you want done with this message, but I pray that the Holy Spirit of God might be able to apply it to each and every heart. Father, give liberty to preach the word tonight, and we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul has been to Thessalonica. And now he is writing to these people. He is writing to a church that has been established there. And unlike the church at Corinth, this is not a carnal church. This is not a church that has a lot of problems. And Paul is giving thanks to God for the folks that are there because when they got saved, there was a transition in their life. And if you would look back in chapter 1, when they got saved, the Bible says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Here was a group of people when they got saved. Brother, they didn't mess around. They didn't half step around. They got right in there and started doing something for the Lord Jesus Christ. But the first thing they did is they turned to God from idols. They got rid of all the junk that was polluting their life. They turned to serve the living and true God, but they didn't try to bring all their garbage and all their luggage and all the stuff along with them. They got rid of that stuff and they got the idols out of their life. You know, a lot of times people get saved and what they want to do is they want to bring all the garbage along with it. And brother, I'll tell you what, I don't know what in the world has happened to old-fashioned preaching on repentance in this country, but brother, I believe when a man gets saved, it involves repentance that that person turns from his sin to the Lord Jesus Christ and brother puts his faith and trust in Jesus and doesn't try to drag along every ungodly, wicked thing that he's been engaged in in this life. And brother, these people, they turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Brother, I'm thankful for people that when they get saved, they make a change in their life. They allow the Lord to make the change in their life and they get the stuff out of there and then it's their desire to go on and serve Jesus Christ. I've seen some of you people from and known some of you people from the day you got saved and you made a commitment that by the grace of God because of His great salvation, you were going to serve Him and you started serving Him back then and you've had some ups and downs, but bless God, you're still here tonight and you're still serving serving Him tonight and you're still trying by the grace of God to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I appreciate people that want to do the job for the Lord. And it ought to be every Christian's desire to turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's what they did. They had been in darkness long enough. They had been in bondage long enough. And brother, they wanted to do something for the Lord. Isn't it funny how sometimes 
the Lord will take somebody that went way down deep in sin. I mean, they went absolutely to the bottom. And He saves them. And these are the ones that seemingly get on fire for God and start working for the Lord Jesus Christ and start doing something for the Lord. Now listen, you don't have to go down to the bottom of the sin pile and get saved from down there, but what in the world is wrong with a person that gets saved as a child and then grows up serving the Lord Jesus Christ? What's wrong with some people that never have been down in the wicked depths of sin, but God in His mercy saved them and spared them from all that wickedness and heartache, and it seems like some of them don't even care whether they ever serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I had Jimmy Hood come into the church. This was back before Joel got saved. And Jimmy came in there and he, he brought a couple of his, his fellows with him. You know, the guys that got saved out of the streets and the gutters and, and the bars and the dope dens and the, the wickedness. And brought some of them with him. Had him testify. And then Brother Hood got up and he preached. And he told how God had delivered him, got him out of the mess that he was in. Joel came up to me after the service and, and he said, uh, Are all preachers drunks and, and, and drug addicts and ex-cons? <laughs> and I said, No, not all of them. But I said, I'll tell you what, it seems like when God saves them, He's done something that they never imagined would uh, be possible and they have just a love and a desire to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. But isn't that the way it is in Scripture? I mean, when Jesus saved the woman at the well, didn't she run back into town and say, come see a man that has told me everything that I've ever done? She was a wicked woman. She had lived a wicked life. She was a miserable existence. But she wanted all the men to come and see a man that had told her everything that she had ever done. And brother, I'll tell you what, there were people that got saved because of the testimony of that woman. She had a love for Jesus. Isn't that what happened to the maniac of Gadara when he got saved? And when he was clothed in his right mind, sitting there at the feet of Jesus, didn't he want to go with the Lord Jesus Christ and follow Him? And Jesus said, no, go, go on home and tell the people back home. I mean, do you remember there in the book of Mark when Jesus heals that leper? And that leper gets uh, uh, healed. And uh, the Lord tells him, He says, now look. He says, uh, don't go out and say anything to any man about this thing. But the, the leper couldn't keep his tongue. And the Bible says that he began to publish it much and to blaze abroad uh, the matter. There was something that took place that no one else could ever do for that man and he couldn't keep his mouth shut about it. And brother, let me tell you something. Jesus Christ has done something for you if you're saved that nothing else and no one else could ever do for you and you ought to have a desire and a willingness to want to serve Jesus. You know why this church, Paul commends them? Because they didn't half step and mess around and goof off for a couple of years. They jumped in there and started serving the Lord Jesus Christ and doing something right away. They turned to God to serve. They turned from idols to serve the living and true God. Had a lady one time stand up in the church and she had got saved as a child. And she said, you know, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed that God would send me to the mission field. And that I would be a missionary. And she said, I never went. And I thought, you know, what's wrong? What's wrong, God? Why won't you send me to the mission field? Why don't you use me as a missionary? And she said, then one day I came in and I heard the preacher preach. And I realized that I am a missionary. God just didn't send me to another country. But I'm a missionary. And I have a mission field. And my mission field is my neighborhood. And my mission field is my work. Uh, uh, the people I work around. And my mission field is my family. And, and she said, I realized that I was a missionary right here at home. And I had a mission. And that was to go out and try to win others to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say to you, don't come down and pray that God will use you as a missionary in a foreign field until you're ready to be a missionary right here at home. I used to do that. I used to come forward every time a missionary came through and I said, God, is this it? Is this where you want me? I'll go, I'll go. And I was willing to go any place. But you see, before God said where He wanted me and, where he, and before He was uh, going to show me where He wanted me, I had to be willing to stay right here and be a missionary right where I was. You know why Paul commends this church? They're serving God. 
They're serving God. But not only are they serving God, they're sounding out the Word of God. It says back there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, it says in verse 8, He says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith that God were to spread abroad so that ye need not, not to speak anything. Uh, Paul said, man, you people are really doing the job. You're going out. You're going through Macedonia and Achaia. The whole area has been saturated with the Word of God because of you people. They were sounding out the Word. Not only that, but they were looking for Jesus to come back. While they were working, while they were serving God, they were looking for the return of the Lord. And the last verse in that first chapter says, And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath of come, to come. These people believed that Jesus was coming back. They believed the message that the Apostle Paul had preached to them. And they were waiting for Jesus Christ to come and deliver them from the wrath to come. Brother, I'll tell you what, there's too many Christians that are sitting around trying to figure out the date of the rapture so they don't have to do anything. Brother, work! For the night is coming when no man's going to work. Work! Even if you only have one day, work that one day. You don't know when the day or the hour is, but brother, we know this. It's on the horizon. It's not way off in the distance someplace. And we ought to be working harder now than we've ever worked before. We ought to be put, putting out more of the Word of God than we ever did before. We ought to be running down the home stretch harder now than we did when we first started out. We ought to be gone for Jesus, full steam ahead, taken out all the stops, gone all the way, so that when that shout takes place and that trumpet sounds, we're taken out of here, not sitting around waiting for Jesus to come, but doing everything that we possibly can because we know He's coming. They were waiting for the return of Jesus. These people got saved. They got going. And there was a job that was well done by these people. Even after Paul left, these people kept on going. What was the secret? How was all this accomplished? Well, in chapter 2, notice what Paul says when he writes to him. In chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, But even after that we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. It wasn't an easy job. There was contention when the gospel of God was being preached. There was people that didn't want it to be done. There was people that wanted to put a stop to it. There was contention. But notice what Paul said. They were bold in the Lord. They were bold in our God. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. You know what the sign of Bible preaching is? The sign of Bible preaching is not how loud you can holler. It's not how high you can jump. It's not how crazy you can act. It's not what kind of antics you can put on before the people. But the sign of Bible preaching is whether a man will stand and proclaim the Word of God with boldness. Have you ever been to one of these churches where a man preached and didn't believe the Bible? And they get up there and brother... Now I'm not talking about the man's, just the man's mannerism. I'm talking about what's coming out of his mouth. And he gets up there and says, Dearly beloved, now we see here from the Scriptures that Jesus obviously was pointing to the fact that if a person was going to do something for Him, they would uh, probably have to forsake some things and, uh, you know, take up the cross. Well, what is all that about? I mean, I don't want to hear something like that. That's not boldness. That's not the way Peter preached. That's not the way John preached. That's not the way the Apostle Paul preached. The Apostle Paul tells Timothy, he says, Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And Paul is exhorting these people, telling them, Listen, when we preached to you, it was done in boldness. We were bold for God. And we declared the Gospel with contention. Take your Bible and look in Acts 4. Acts 4. Here's the sign of Bible preaching. I mean, just turn TBN off. 
Forget about all these, these goofballs and actors. I mean, every now and then, every now and then, I flip over and watch one. Of, I mean, they're like clowns. I mean, they're just up there entertaining people. They, they like clowns. All they lack is the makeup. They're just like clowns. They ought to have a great big nose on, big rosy cheeks, you know, big white eyes. Uh-huh, here I am, I'm Bozo the Clown, and I've come to give you another Bozo Bible lesson. <laughs> because that's what it is. They don't have fire in their eyes. They don't have any boldness about them. They talk about the filling of the Holy Spirit and they haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit and they don't know what the Bible says about New Testament preaching and if they do, they don't say anything about it. I'm going to get your money though. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Look at this. Man, in Acts chapter 4, old Peter, he's preaching. I mean, he's preaching to everybody, every opportunity he has. He's get, he preaches. Uh, I mean, somebody drops the hat and Peter preaches. <laughs> And if no one drops the hat, Peter drops the hat and he goes ahead and preaches, man. I mean, he's just going to be preaching and when he preaches, knows what he's going to do. He says there in verse 10, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, digging them, whom God raised from the dead, ooh, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Brother, I'll tell you what, Peter is sounding it out. He's pointing the finger right at him. He said, you crucified him. You're the builders. You've rejected the stone. And he put it on them and told them that there is salvation in none other outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's talking to Orthodox Jews, by the way. <laughs> What'd they do? It says in verse 15, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Brother, let me tell you something. Bold preaching has to do, regardless of the man's mannerism, whether he gets demonstrative, whether he gets in it or not, those words that come out of his mouth, they're going to be bold words, they're going to be Bible words, they're not going to be flattering words, they're not going to rub the cat the wrong way every time. And listen, they're going to be anointed somehow by the Holy Spirit of God, and God's Holy Spirit will take the truth that comes out of that man's mouth and put His anointing on it, and when it smites the hearts and ears of those hearers, they'll know that God has spoken to them. Boldness. Paul brings an exhortation, and he says, when we were there, we came to you, in boldness. We could go through many scriptures in the book of Acts. I won't do it tonight, but many, many scriptures in the book of Acts on boldness. They prayed in Acts chapter 4. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they went out and they spake the word of God with boldness. The apostle Paul, he gets there. Saul gets saved and becomes Paul. And he turns around and starts preaching boldly in the name of Jesus. I can be bold. I can be bold not because it's my nature or my characteristic, but I can be bold because I have an infallible, inerrant, absolute, undeniable, unrefutable book called the Bible. And when I put that thing out there, I don't have to, I don't have to apologize for it. I don't, have to, I don't have to back up and beat around the bush about it. I can just throw it out there. And if somebody says, I don't like that, I'll say, okay. Don't like it. Tell it to God. Tell God you don't like it. Tell God you don't like His book. Tell God. As long as I'm preaching this book, I can be bold. And brother, the sign of boldness. And boldness in the, the sign of Bible preaching is boldness. Boldness has a ring that comes with it. And again, doesn't necessarily have to be loud. I'm loud. And I'm loud for a reason. You know, I find it strange that when people go to a ball game, they like it loud. I find it strange when a person's in the house and listening to the radio, they like it loud. I find it strange that, uh, you know, when a person sits down and, and they're watching the television, they uh, turn it up, I can't hear it in here. And they, they like things loud. 
But why is it when they come to church, they don't want it loud? Oh, he preaches too loud. Well, you don't say anything about your kid that's playing rock and roll music blaring so hard that it's about to knock the windows out. You don't tell them to turn it down, turn it off. Do you? I hope you do. <laughs> Maybe there's somebody in here that doesn't, though. <laughs> I mean, people don't mind. You go to a ball game, buddy. You say, man, they really got in it. They, it was loud. That's what, you, that's what you mean. It was loud. So people come to church. I like to give them what they're used to. <laughs> Make it loud. But brother, I'll tell you what, don't confuse loudness with boldness. A person can be bold and not be loud. I want you to notice this. They not only were bold in what they were doing when they come, but, but notice this. Notice this next thing. It says in verse 3, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. When the Apostle Paul came to them and preached to them, not only was it done in boldness, but there was no deceit, there was no uncleanness, and there was no guile. No guile. They didn't butter it up. According to verse 5, they didn't butter it up. For neither at any time use we flattering words. Paul didn't use the words of man's wisdom. He didn't pull out the dictionary and study the big words so that he can impress people. He used simple words. He used scriptural words. He used Bible words. Take your Bible and go back to 1 Corinthians for a minute. 1 Corinthians. And notice what the Apostle Paul said there when he came to these people. Chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech, if there was anyone that could have used excellent speech, it would have been the Apostle Paul, trained at the feet of Gamaliel, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. If there was ever a man that could have used the excellent speech and given them all the nice flowery words that their ears would have just loved to hear, it would have been the Apostle Paul. But he said, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling and my speech. And my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the, Holy, of the Spirit and of power. That's how Paul came. Paul came with the Word of God. Paul came with, what thus saith the Lord. And he didn't use the flowery, buttering up words. When they came, they came with pure motive. See, this was a group of people... They got a job done, but when those that came in unto them, they came in with a pure motive. They were not covetous. They didn't come in to get something from those people, but to minister something to them. They didn't come to get glory from man. Their motives were pure. And because their motives were pure, their message was powerful. And it says there, in verse 4, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. And they preached the gospel. And those people came to know Jesus Christ. The messages were powerful. What makes a message powerful? It's not the illustrations. It's not the outlines. It's the Holy Spirit taking His Word and using it. The power is contained in the Word. The power is not necessarily contained in the man, but the power is contained in the Word. What did Paul say? Look, look once more at Romans chapter 1. We read this this morning, but look once more at it. Romans chapter 1. Paul says in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. And Paul said, I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel. The power is in the book. The power is in the word. The power is in the gospel. And they came and they were powerful in their message. The exhortation that these people received was of God. They preached the Word of God. And when they preached it, Paul says down in verse 13, 
And, and he says, For this cause we thank God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in you that believe. When you come in to church, do you come in and say, God, show me something from your book, show me something from your word. Have you ever, have you ever heard a message preached? And maybe just a couple words jumped, I mean literally jumped off of the page and just struck you. It's happened to me just reading my Bible. It's happened to me when I've gone and heard other men preach. I don't know how the Word of God works on other people. I just know how it works on me. And sometimes it's like, a, it's like a, somebody hits me with a, with a, a, a hammer, a, a big old maul or a sledgehammer right between the eyes. I'm, Man, why didn't I ever see that before? The power of the Word of God. When it's received as it truly is, the Word of God and not the Word of man. These people got a job done. Paul came in there, preached the gospel, preached it in power, preached it for the right motive. Those people got saved. And brother, they turned to God from idols. Started serving the Lord. The next thing I want you to notice, when the Apostle Paul came in to do the job with the Thessalonicas, and got the great results that he did, I want you to notice this, that he was gentle among them. He was an example Verse 7 says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. When they came in, they were gentle. Look what the Bible says about this. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul tells Timothy his young son in the faith, he says in verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. He says the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Titus chapter 3 Another young man that Paul writes to. Notice what he says to Titus in, in, uh, in chapter 3 and verse 1. Uh, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready uh, to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lust and pleasures, living in malice and and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of, our, of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. But he says there that the, that the, uh, uh, the man of God is to not be a brawler, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. They were bold in declaring the word. They were bold in putting out the word with much contention. But listen, when it got right down on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis, Paul was a very gentle man. Paul had a heart and compassion for souls. Paul not only wanted to impart the gospel to him, but he was willing to put his soul on the line for these people that they might come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. You know what we're guilty of, don't you? We're guilty so many times of going out and just cramming the gospel down somebody's mouth, just slapping it on them. There it is! And I know that God can at times use even that. But was the Apostle Paul that way? The Apostle Paul was a man who was gentle when it came to a one-on-one -on -one dealing with other people. And I believe the Lord wants us to be gentle Present it in boldness. Pray that God will use it. And plead with that individual that they might come to know Jesus as their Savior. Use everything that you can to point that man to Jesus Christ or that woman to Jesus Christ. When Paul stood before Agrippa 
He used his testimony. He used his knowledge of Agrippa's knowledge of, of, the, of the word. He used the scriptures. And he persuaded, he persuaded Agrippa to turn to Jesus Christ and become a Christian. And Agrippa said, Almost thou hast persuaded me. There's nothing wrong with using that which God gives you. But sometimes I think we confuse brashness for boldness and we cease to be compassionate on a person who's dead and his trespasses and sin and is blind and cannot see the light and is a hater of God and doesn't even know why. If we're going to do the job, those in Thessalonica did the job, if we're going to do the job, we're going to have to be gentle. Verse 7, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. What does a nurse maid do for a child? That nurse maid will care for that child. That nurse will take care of that child and look after that child and protect that child. Make sure that the things done are in the best interest of that child. When a person gets saved, how do we treat them? When somebody gets saved and they come in the church, how do we treat them? Do we look at them? Do we say, well, in our minds, do we look at them and say, well, I don't think that one's going to fit in right here? Do we look at some man when he comes in and he has an earring in his ear? Maybe his hair is long. Maybe he's wearing something that you don't feel like is appropriate. Do you give him a chance? Do you care about his soul? Or do you let the outward appearance create a judgment in you and say in your heart, we don't want you in here. Where if you would take that individual and cherish them as a nurse cherisheth her children and teach them and train them and protect them from the, the wolves that are out there that are going to come next you might see a great transformation take place in that individual's life. Paul was gentle and he loved and had compassion. In verse 11, he says it again a different way. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. As a father doth his children. We need to be gentle with a new Christian, with a lost person. We need to be gentle. Let me say this. They were also separated. In verse 10, he says, Ye are witnesses. And God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. They were separated. You know, I believe Paul was a separated man. I believe Paul had convictions. I believe Paul had standards. But I never read where Paul ever tried to cram any of them down anybody's throat. You know, I never read where Paul said, Now women, you got to dress just like this, just like this right here. He told them to be modest. He told them to put on uh, the, the, the hidden man. Uh, he told them not to get carried away with the outward appearance and with the gold and with the apparel. But you know what preachers are doing nowadays? They're saying women have to do this and they have to do this and they set up the standards. But what happens when the preacher goes? <laughs> the standards change because the next guy comes in he might have different standards. And the standards change. You know what you have to do? You have to live holy in the sight of God. You have to live justly in the sight of God. You have to live unblameably in the sight of God. You have to realize that if you are going to appear as a child of God and a Christian in this age, then you're going to have to appear like Jesus wants you to appear. I know preachers, and I've heard of preachers that 
you know, they go as far as to say, well, you know, your pant cuff has to be a certain thing and, and you can't wear wire rimmed glasses. Elton John, that queer rock and roll singer, he wears plastic rimmed glasses. Okay, well, now you can't wear plastic rim glasses. Well, some other fruitcake comes along, he might wear contact lenses. Then you, pretty soon, everybody that wears any kind of glasses got to be the devil. <laughs> you know what you need to do? You know what people need to do? They need to find out how God wants them to live and do it according to the Word of God, and do it the scriptural way. And brother, what we don't need to do is look at someone else and start tearing them down because they don't have the standards we have. They don't have the Bible we have. They don't have the teaching we have. They haven't had God uh, deal with them as long as we have. These people were gentle. When Paul comes in, he was gentle with these people. Then the last thing I want you to see here is what they did. Where did they concentrate their energy? Verse 9, it says, For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because ye would not be chargeable, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. They spent their time and their energy laboring and travailing. They worked and they prayed among these people. Witnessing. Preaching. Praying. Sometimes we get so busy with other things. Sometimes we get so busy with just working and supplying for ourselves that we don't have any energy left to do something for Jesus Christ. There's people in this day and age that don't go to church because they're just too tired. They don't go to church because they just don't feel like it. They don't read the Bible and study because it's just been a hard week. They don't witness because they've had problems and all their energy is consumed on living life none of it is consumed on doing spiritual things for the Lord Jesus Christ and when we get to the judgment seat of Christ let me tell you something this being tired thing and I just had too many other things to do and I just didn't feel like it that just won't hold any water at the judgment seat of Christ because God's going to have people up there that literally burnt themselves out. Preaching, teaching, praying, witnessing, winning, planning, sowing, and they burnt themselves out doing those things for Jesus Christ. These people at Thessalonica did a good job. And Paul said, when we came unto you, in unto you, we were bold. When we came in unto you, we set an example. And when we came in unto you, our energy was focused on working in the spiritual realm. And we weren't a burden to you. And then they turned around and followed the example and did what these that had come into Thessalonica had showed them to do. And they didn't have problems. They went on and did a work for Jesus Christ. They did a job, and the job was well done. When you hit the judgment seat of Christ, is the Lord going to say, you did a job, and the job was well done? I hope He does. Let's stand for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father tonight, Lord, we come to You. Lord, I know some of these people have, have, have gotten weary, and Lord, we all do. But yet, Lord, your word says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. God, I pray that you'd give a shot of spiritual energy, energy to your people tonight, that you would lift up their spirit, 
and that you would show them the job that is set before them and that, Father, they would go out of here with a determination to run the race, to fight the fight, to take the stand, and to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, I pray that you would bless this church and this work and the work that has been done in the past and the work that will be done in the future. And God, I pray that you would bring into this church people who are workers and people who want to do something for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. And Father, may we never come to the place where we want to just learn the things of God so that we can go out and, and, and try to present ourselves as some kind of a spiritual giant. But Lord, may we learn the things of God so that we might be able to go out and be a servant of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we serve others and minister to them the gospel, the grace of God. Lord, we're thankful for those that came to us and ministered the word to our hearts when we were dead in our sin. Lord, I thank you tonight for Bob Love that stood on the corner and told me about you. And Father, others can point to the person that was responsible for them coming to know you. God, help us to go out and do the same work and to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and get us going and keep us going until you return. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Well, page what we sing. Page 368. Page 368, as we sing, maybe you need to come tonight and do some praying. Maybe you've run out of steam. Maybe you've not been as active as you once were. Maybe you've gotten weary in well-doing. But listen, the secret of a job well done is for us to come in here, and I say us, but because I almost feel like part of you here, but for you to come in here and for you to listen to the Word of God that's presented to you, apply it to your life, and then go out and do something with it. I told you this morning, when I come in, if I came in here or tonight, if I came in here, I'd come in as a sponge. But then I'd want to get wrung out through the week so I could come back in here and soak up some more and go out and wring out. Now, you know something? If, if the sponge just soaks in and, and, and what is in that sponge doesn't get used, if it doesn't get wrung out, then it, it starts to sour. And the worst thing that can happen for, to a church is to have a bunch of sour sponges. Ask God to wring you out. Ring you out when you go out in the workplace. Ring you out when you go out there to your neighbors. And ring out the things that God has allowed you to soak in. And then come back in and soak in some more. Go out and let it be wrung out for Jesus Christ. If God has spoke to your heart and you need to come, you come as we sing. Take